Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors and here's other people. Love that. Uh, first of all, shout out to the class of 89 in the house. That's good times. <laughs> Appreciate you guys showing up. It was our 30th class reunion and I'm not that old. Everybody else is, but not me. Oh, oh, we are oh. Yeah, we are. Uh, I guess I have to fess up time. <laughs> And I guess since I got held back in second grade, I'm probably older than most of you. <laughs> Truth be told, just saying, just saying. Does it come, this come up? No, the notes at the bottom. On the next slide. Oh. Aha! All right. I'm learning how to do this whole technology thing here. I'll have it down by the end of the month. But um, the, uh, as I was looking at and trying to decide what, what I should talk about over the next month, uh, as Rafer opened it up for me, uh, I looked back at my own journey and um, my own walk with God. And, and there was a, a point in time where I was really kind of upset with the church and uh, upset with everything that was going on and I started looking at different things and and uh, really had to come back to what what was God's design for the church anyway and how did we get to where we are now and so that's kind of what this series is all about is what is what what is God's real design for the church and what are we really supposed to be doing and how are we really supposed to be putting this whole thing together um, so that's what we're looking at. Um, just by a show of hands, how many of you have positive memories of church as a kid? Okay. How many of you have not so positive memories of the church as a kid? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I understand that. Uh, any VBS kids here? You went to VBS? Okay. Uh, how many uh, Sunday school? You got Sunday school going on, happening? All right. Um, and hard pews and organs and hymns and all that stuff. Uh, I remember when I was a, a kid, there are very few memories I have of church as a kid. And, and one of them was on, at the church on 7th and Main. Uh, we went there for a while, I guess. And I remember climbing underneath the pews because the pew stuck out about this far, this much farther than the wall at the back. And so... During the service, you know, I'd try to sit behind my parents, and so during the service, you'd just kind of slide down and get underneath the pews and crawl underneath the pews and uh, try to climb out that little back and then go out the front or go out the door and hang out on the steps or whatever till church was over. But uh, I think I got caught. I know I did. <laughs> but uh, whether, it's, whether it's positive or negative and what our church memories are, um, the biggest influence I believe that we have on us are the people that are in the church, uh, the people that you interacted with. You know, if you had a great Sunday school teacher, you love Sunday school. If you didn't have a great Sunday school teacher, not so much. Uh, I remember going to Sunday school with one of my friends, you know, just I stayed the night at their house or whatever and then went to Sunday school with them the next day. And so we're, we're in this Sunday school class and we're in a circle, right? And the teacher's there and, and uh, so they're asking questions. They're Breck, what do you think? I'm like, Psh, uh, uh, Jesus? <laughs> you know, I don't know what's going on. I just know I didn't want to be called on, you know, uh, to answer the question. Kind of like in math class when they say, hey, why don't you come up to the board and solve this problem? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't want to do that ever, ever. Um, there's a comedian, Steve Harvey, you know him, one of my favorites. Anyway, he was doing a stand up and uh, he, he talks about his um, church as a kid. And uh, he said, you know, they were in church every time the doors were open, you know, four nights a week and uh, choir practice and midweek and you know everything prayer meeting and everything that was going on but he said uh, you know church took on a whole new meaning when 
when he understood that his mom's best friend, Sister Odell, cussed. <laughs> he said, suddenly I wanted to go to church all the time because I just wanted to see what she was going to say next. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's hilarious. I get it. You know, somebody being real right in the middle of there. And uh, <laughs> when, we were, when we were forming this thing and uh, we were, you know, getting together and, and talking about you know, what, what we would be like and all that kind of stuff. One of the ladies that was in that group of people, she said, uh, you know, I think uh, the best description is we love Jesus, but we cuss a little. <laughs> you know, we're not perfect people. We're just not. You know, we try to be, we try to align our lives with Jesus. We don't always make that mark, uh, but we do love him. You know, we do strive for that. And uh, so those people uh, are some of the best ones. Um, the other story I have as a kid, and uh, I've told it before, but it's one of my favorites. Um, I guess I was a little kid in the nursery, and I had had trouble before in the nursery with, the, with that program. Uh, because in my mind as a kid, if it was structured, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I wanted to do my own thing, make my own rules, do what I wanted to do. And church and school, both of those things were way too structured. For me in that realm but anyway my dad had uh, got me up that morning and had talked to me and told me how good I was gonna be you know <laughs> you're gonna be good today aren't you yes yes dad I'll be good and uh, so we go to church and uh, it was at First Baptist Church uh, on you know where it is and uh, <laughs> So, at First Baptist Church, and, and uh, so he drops me off at the nursery and uh, turns to walk away. And in, in his recollection of the story, as, I tur as he turned to walk away, he hears the nursery worker screaming. And so he turns around to find out what was going on. And I guess as he rounds the corner, I turn around and say, Dad, I was going. She didn't have to pull me. <laughs> and I, I guess I kicked her in the shins with the hard leather shoes that I had. And <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, it didn't turn out well for me. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we have those stories, good and bad. We have those memories, some of them great um, VBS stories, you know, as a kid. And, and I never went to many of them, but I remember a few uh, that were good. But um, God's design for the church and what that is supposed to look like, I'm not sure he had VBS in mind uh, when he put that whole thing together. Maybe he did. I don't know. Um, but we're going to be looking at what he laid out as a design and then how we emulate that, how we put that into practice. What does that look like for us? Um, the word church, uh, the original word for church in the Bible is ecclesia. And uh, it means, it literally means a called out assembly or congregation. And that could be a political uh, it could be an educational, uh, it could be anything, but it's a, it's a called out assembly or congregation. And then um, in 1556, they translated that word church. And, uh, and then, you know, 1611, I think it was, is when the King James Version came out and uh, they put that in there. Uh, for that word, ecclesia, and uh, it, it began to take on this notion that the church was this hierarchy, higher, yeah, hierarchy uh, authority uh, over a congregation. That was the church. It wasn't the people, but it was the structure uh, that encompassed the people, uh, and it became a building. And so, you know, when you drive down the street now and you see a steeple, you go, oh, there's a church. Well, that's not a church. That's a building with a steeple on it, but that's how we know it. You know, and so, um, but we know that that's different. We know that it's the people, right? But for some reason in our mind, that's, that's where we go because that's kind of how we were raised. We're going to church and then you walk in a building and now we're in church. But those same group of people, same people in your house is not the church. That's a small group, um, but it's the church, yeah. right? That's who we are. And so when we talk church over the next, when I say church over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about the assembly of God, not the building. 
Uh, the building's like the least important thing, although we really appreciate this one, uh, because we started in the park, and, uh, and that was all kinds of fun for those of you that were with us in the park for the first, I don't know, what month or so? Co oh, a couple weeks. <laughs> Seemed like a month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, that's how great it was. We talked about... Uh, going back to the park at like our one year anniversary, we're like, mm, this is kind of comfortable. <laughs> Let's just stay here because the park is cold in the morning. And uh, anyway, digress. Uh, anyway, his design for the church uh, is reflected through the lives of the people uh, in the whole earth. And I don't want us to miss that. We're really going to kind of pay attention to that in the whole earth today. Uh, but this is seen in... Uh, I got to remember, I got to click slides. Maybe. Is it working? Oh. Oh, it's not working on here. Okay. All right. One more. God's design for his people. Let's go. Have us reflected in the lives of the people in the whole earth. And this is seen in a few ways. Um, First of all, it's, uh, it's seen in the, great, the first commission. The first commission that God gave man in Genesis uh, 1.28. It says, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every living creature that moves on the ground. He created man in this relationship with him. To cast out his glory, his rule in the whole earth, in the whole world. Um, it's also seen in the Great Commission, uh, Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And then also in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 9-13, This then is how you should pray. Our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You take those three commissions and you kind of smash them together and you, you begin to see the heart of God uh, throughout the whole earth. First of all, he created man in this relationship to be his rule on the earth. And, and it was this crazy relationship where God and Adam hung out, like literally hung out, walk in the cool of the day. I mean, I don't know what that's like. You know, I dig that time of day. It's my favorite time of day. But I can't imagine, you know, hanging out. Hey, God shows up. Hey, cool. Let's talk about the day. I named a fish today. <laughs> it's pretty cool. I was snorkeling. I don't know how they do that. But, you know, I don't know. I saw this thing and I named it a rhinoceros. I don't know if that was his name for it either. But we're going to go with it. But, um. Uh, you know, he created this relationship with man, with this, and his rule over the earth, and he just kind of handed it to us. And then as it, as it goes and things fell apart, it was his redemptive love chasing after us, like we just sang about a few minutes ago, to redeem that relationship, to redeem that rule over the whole earth. And then he gave us this prayer. They call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's really how he's teaching us to pray or the disciples to pray at that point um, it wasn't his prayer it was his teaching of prayer and he gave us this and there's really three things that I want to focus on today uh, out of this prayer that kind of summarize what I believe is his heart for the church yeah yeah Did I, oh sorry I was ahead of you I'm getting there. Give me some grace. <laughs> the first one is, uh, your kingdom come. Um, the kingdom of God is the rule of God 
and it's established with his presence. As, as, as he hung out with man in the garden, in the cool of the day, it was his presence that established the authority. He gave that authority to man. Man didn't just have it, right? He gave that authority. He handed off that authority. You are my creation. You are my child. I'm handing this to you. Uh, there were times in high school where, uh, well, many times in high school, where I got pulled over by the police. I know it's hard to imagine, <laughs> but I got pulled over. And um, 99 times out of 100, well, actually it was like 19 times out of 21, but um, <laughs> no one's counting. No one's counting. They would pull me over and they would say license and registration and I would grab my license and get my registration out and hand it to them and, uh, and then they would do this. They would get it and look at it and then lean in and look in the, in the car and go, are you Tommy Sneed's son? Yes, sir. Okay. And they would hand my license back to me and they would say, does your dad know what you're doing tonight? Sure. <laughs> Probably not that I'm here right now doing what I just did, but. And then he would follow me home. And they would uh, follow me home and get to my house. And, and uh, then my dad would come outside and, you know, I just wish they'd give me a ticket. <laughs> you know? Or they would let me go that night and then they would contact my dad the next day and say, hey, I uh, pulled your son over last night. Oh, really? You know, and then it all comes crashing down the next day. I uh, hate it when that happens. Um, and it happened more than other times. But um, it wasn't that I was anybody special. It wasn't that I had a reputation. It wasn't that I had any clout at all for them to let me go. It was because of my dad. It was because of his reputation. It was because of his character that they let me go and I didn't get that then I was just upset that I had to deal with the consequences of my actions you know what I mean uh, when I was finally about 27 I went back to my dad and said you know hey I'm sorry um, didn't know I was really dragging your name through the mud all but I was and I'm I get it now and I'm sorry <laughs> but it was because of his authority and his character that I was treated differently and it's God's authority and God's rule uh, established by his presence that makes the difference for me. Uh, that's what it is. His presence in me, on me. And I invite that, uh, and we invite that uh, together. Um, the presence of God is overwhelming. No doubt about that. If you've ever experienced that, it blows you away. Um, in Exodus uh, 33, 34, or I'm sorry, 34 through 35. Uh, no, I'm not there. I'm way ahead on the slide. Anyway, 33, 13 through 23, Moses is meeting with God. And he's up on the mountain and he's looking for... Um, direction. He's, you know, they're out in the middle of the wilderness and he doesn't know how to lead and he doesn't know what to do. So he's hanging out with God on this mountaintop and pleading with him. And um, he says, unless you go with us, I'm not going. Unless you, unless your presence is going with us, I'm not leaving this mountaintop. I'm not going down there to lead these people. We're not going anywhere unless you go with us. And then God took him and said, I'm going to grant your request. And to let you know that I'm granting your request, I'm going to put you in the cleft of this rock and I'm going to put my hand over you and I'll pass by. And then you'll be able to see my backside. Because no one can see my front and live. And so he did. And Moses came down off of that mountain and was changed by the presence of God. <clears throat> And the presence of God changes us. When he did come down from the mountaintop, 34 through 35, Moses' face was glowing. Like he wasn't white. He was glowing. He wasn't a ginger. He was glowing. You get what I'm saying? Like at nighttime, he was glowing. So much so that he had to put a veil on. 
because the people were freaking out. Like someone lit the light bulb inside this dude and he's shining out. It changed who he is. Uh, in Acts chapter uh, 16, uh, Paul and Silas were in prison. They got imprisoned. And uh, they're sitting there in the middle of prison and about midnight. The chains fall off. The angel shows up and the chains fall off. And they walk out. And the guard freaks out and is like, hey, he was going to kill himself. And he said, hey, don't do that. The guard took him to his house. And him and his whole family were believers. It changes us. It changes who we are. In between my junior and senior year in high school, God got a hold of my life. And uh, it was a pretty drastic change at that moment. Um, a lot of who I was and a lot of what I was involved in, um, I couldn't do that anymore. And I remember going home that night. It was like a Sunday night church. And I remember going home that night being changed and not really knowing what to do with it. You understand? Uh, but I knew I was different. I knew something had changed inside of me that night. And, uh, and I went home and I didn't know how to deal with it. I knew that uh, all of a sudden the music I was listening to was unacceptable. Uh, you know, different things. I, the guys that I was hanging out with, Roman, Dean, Kyle, you know, those guys. Uh, all of a sudden the stuff that we did <laughs> wasn't acceptable anymore. And I remember hanging out with them the next day and going, guys, I can't do what we used to do. I can't be a part of what I do anymore. And it changed my world. And it was hard. Um, I remember spending a lot of Friday nights at my house because not knowing who to go out with, <laughs> you know, because the guys I grew up with, I couldn't hang out with them anymore. The presence of God changes who we are. And if it doesn't change who we are, I challenge the presence of, that you are in the presence of God. Yeah. Because He changes who we are. You cannot not be changed when you're in the presence of God. So your kingdom come, your will be done. Um, and His presence is the predecessor to his will being done. When God's will, when he wants his will to be done, his presence shows up. And in the middle of his presence, change happens. Uh, Acts chapter 5, 17 through 25, the apostles are in jail. And uh, again, an angel freed them and, uh, and told them, hey, go out and speak again. Because that's why they were in jail in the first place. They were out speaking about Jesus and his resurrection. And uh, the Pharisees and religious leaders of the day couldn't put up with that. So they arrested them, put them in jail. And in the middle of jail, the angel shows up, freed them. And by the way, their chains were still locked. Doors were still locked, everything. But they're outside. And uh, so the, the next day, the leaders come and they're like, how did they get out? And the jailer's like, I don't know. Everything's still locked up. But they're in the middle of the street. Again, preaching about the risen Christ. And it's interesting in verse number 38. He said, uh, you need to let these men go. Because if you don't, if you try to come at, come at them, you're only going to find yourself fighting God. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. You need to let these men go do what they do. The presence of God is on them. It's obvious. You need to just let them go. Because if you try to go against them, you're only going to find yourself fighting against God. Yeah. And everybody knows that's a losing battle. And they listen to that and uh, they just let them go. Your will be done. And God's will is to have a relationship with us. And His glory is revealed in the relationship with us. Again, it's not that we have any clout or authority anywhere. It's not that we have any power to affect change in the life of someone else. We don't. Right, right. 
unless God shows up because God's the one that affects the change in the life of the person. Not me, not you, not a pastor that's on TV with a church of 10,000. He's not the one that does it. It's the presence of God that shows up that affects the change in the lives of the people. And his presence is, the, is that predecessor. And it is, it's his will to have a relationship with us so that presence can affect the change in us that needs to be yeah. to make us right. If we're all honest this morning, if we were honest, we're not all right. And I don't mean all right, like we're okay. I mean we're not all right. Yeah. There are things in our life that aren't right. And we try to affect change in those areas to make them right. But the only thing that will make those things right is the presence of God. Yeah. And in that relationship with Him, as I surrender, as I see the need to surrender my life to Him, yeah. and He comes into me, then that change, is it affects that change in me. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the unright becomes right. Yeah. And I can live different. Not because I want to live different, not because I'm making myself live different, not because I'm struggling to live different. I'm just able to live different. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's his relationship with us in the whole earth. It's the whole earth that he's making right. The unright that was unrighted. Uh, with the Garden of Eden and the Adam and Eve, the curse that was placed on there, it's the whole earth that he's making right. Not just the individual things in our lives, but all of creation that he's making right, that he desires to make right. And here's the crazy thing. He desires to make creation right through you and me. That was the original design. Wow. What responsibility do I have? What crazy things does he want to do in me? I have no idea. But I know that's his plan. And God's will in your life, he'll let you know what that is. Um, I've talked to a lot of different people over the years and, you know, one of the common themes that, that I hear is, you know, I, I wonder what God's will for my life is. You know, I wonder what he wants me to do or I'm faced with this decision. Do I take this job or do I take this job? Do I move here? Do I go there? And uh, so, especially with like 18 year olds and college and uh, or graduating from college and wondering you know what job should I take all those kind of things but hey we we change jobs and make career changes all the time we do a whole lot of different things but we're always wondering hey what's God's will for my life and what should I do and um, I want to suggest to you today that uh, you're not gonna miss it there are some things that he just allows you to make decisions over. He's given you authority. He's made you the ruler. So you're allowed to make that change or make that decision and, and go here or there. And it would be fine either way. But if God has a, has a specific thing for you to do, if he's picked you out and aligned you out for something specific to do, you can't miss that. You can't miss it. He will, he will chase you down. He will burn a bush right in front of you uh, that don't burn up. He will knock you off your horse and blind you. Uh, there are, I mean, he's going to do something to get your attention. He won't let you miss it. Yeah. But we're given freedom to make a lot of choices, to do a lot of things, to do whatever you want me to do, God. But if there's something specific that he's picked out for you to do, you're not going to be able to miss that. But it's all about the presence. Right. It's all about his presence yeah. in my life. And the closer I am to him, the easier it is to hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit in my life. And the farther I'm away, the harder it is to hear the whisper. Yeah. His presence affects change in who I am. And it affects change in my world, yeah. in my family, 
at my job, with the people I work with, the people I hang out with. It affects change in those areas because of His presence in my life. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And then on earth as it is in heaven. God's desire is for our culture on earth to mimic or to mirror the culture in heaven. That's his desire. When he created this world and he created Eden and he put Adam and Eve in the middle of Eden, it was his desire that that culture mimic the culture of heaven. And he created this perfect world. And then this perfect place, but it wasn't just supposed to be that place because he said, hey, be fruitful, yeah. grow in number, and rule over the whole world. And so there was adventure tapped into the original plan of God. There was the whole earth tapped into the plan of God. They were to extend that Eden over the whole earth. The rule of God, the presence of God, the authority of God over the whole world. I wonder what, would, what it would look like today if, if uh, Eve hadn't have been so headstrong. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was both their fault, but I like to blame Eve because she's a woman. So, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay, hang with me. Two more minutes, I swear. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm going to get beat up when I walk out the door. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> But that's his, that, that was his plan in the beginning. And then as, as things broke down and his plan changed, it was still the pursuit of us. It was still his presence with us. It was still always his glory, his presence, his rule over the whole earth through us. That's always been his plan. And it's carried out in little small ways in your life, in my life, in your relationships, in my relationships, your marriage, my marriage, your kids, my kids, your work, my work, your customers, and my customers, the way we treat them, the way we deal with them, how fair we are, all of those things. It's the rule of God being carried out into the whole earth for His glory. Yeah. It's the same thing as the cop leaning down and looking at me. I was nothing but a punk kid. But it was the authority of my dad yeah. and why he didn't give me the ticket. I'm just a punk kid still. But it's the authority of my Heavenly Father yeah. that makes living this life good. It's His authority and His will in my life that allows me to be free and not be bound up and not be a slave to anything. And I live in that freedom every day and there's nothing that I've done to deserve it. It's only because I'm His kid. You're His kid. We live in that freedom. We have the ability to live in that freedom. And if there are things that are not right in our world, we invite His presence in. And as His presence comes in and we sense and we are aware of His presence, His presence changes us so that the situations that are not right become right. And we have the power or the authority to deal with them, to get over, with, to get over them, to set them aside. So the only rule in our life is His rule. Yeah. And we live in that freedom. And He longs for the atmosphere of Eden to be restored. For the lion to lay down with the lamb. For the character of God to be displayed in our lives in the whole earth. This morning as we um, go into the holy place, it's what we call it, uh, because our services are kind of fashioned after the tabernacle. And uh, so we just spend a few moments 
allowing God to do whatever God needs to do in us. So we just spend some time listening to him, listening for his presence. And then if he prompts, I just encourage you to obey. Sometimes that may mean turning to your spouse and going, you know what, I'm sorry for my attitude the last couple of days. I realize now that it may not have been so great. Or maybe there's some reconciliation that needs to take place. Maybe there's some things uh, that are eating you away that you need to hand over to God. But we just take this time over the next few minutes and allow God to do whatever God wants to do. And I encourage you just to respond to him. So.